Johnny? Drew, how we doing? Um, dude, I'm my ass is dragging. I can't lie. Dude, I, I was up all night and then got up at six central. I had to get my kids ready. But you know what? It was history in the making. Um, talking to Nito. Um literally um I feel like we've seen the fall of Berlin. <laughs> that is great. That is funny. So we're we on the the last call with Travis here this last hour. Yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, your governor got beat, but I was telling Nito I listened on the uh, radio. They said legislators still a super majority, and then uh, hit it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but uh, he still got. Uh, it's more of a power for legislation than. Um, than governor there. So yeah, if you're ready to light it up, let's let's rock and roll. Top of the hour. Well, um, everyone, welcome. You know, we've had a uh, great run of of the D2 crystal ball, perfectly timing the dates for our investment webinars. So, uh, so welcome to this month's webinar. As always, this is your host, Certified Master Coach John Randall. As always, we have our D2 investment guru, Drew Watson. So, Drew, let's jump right into it. What's uh, what's your thoughts on the the wild election outcome? Well, nobody saw all of this coming. I will say this: you know, we get our information from from BCA, and uh, basically, um, you know, they felt like Trump had a way to win, and uh, Jack was going to work on my screen as I pull up some, <laughs> some symbols here, John. But but basically, um, oh, share screen. Sorry, no. sorry about that. I'm not the I'm not the tech tracker, as they say. But but basically, um, you know, when we get our information, they felt like it would probably you know they had always said that as long as Clint as long as Trump was within three points, he had a chance to win because they felt like. Globally, that's kind of how much overstated polls were to the left. And in a big picture, you know, my discussion points with clients have been this. Since 19, early 1990s, the world has been on a one-way trade of globalization. And what you've had is a group of constitu constituencies on the left – and on the right, that have seen their standard of was it your phone? Hey, John, can you hear me? Yeah, oh, sorry. yeah. Sorry, they're, they're trying to kill me. The Matrix. Uh, <laughs> but basically, th there's been a set of of constituencies on the left and the right that have seen their wages stagnate due to globalization coming into businesses mainly manufacturing, where uh, people would have maybe a high school diploma, semi-skilled, uh, where they probably, in, in Carolina, they could get a job at a furniture plant or, you know, up here at, at a steel mill. Uh, and those jobs have been slowly fading away, and they've seen on an inflation-adjusted basis their wages stagnate now for 15 or 20 years. And with each increasing election, uh, or referendum, uh, this trend has been building. And if you took that political spectrum with, say, Sanders on the left and Trump on the right and took that spectrum as, as, as one piece of pipe and folded it around to where you had a circle, and let's say Bernie Sanders' economic policies are at 11.59 p.m. and Donald Trump's are at 12.01 a.m., they're virtually, they're more identical than they are apart. And so this was the perfect moment in the American experience for these type of candidates to emerge, for Trump to win, and then for Trump to actually carry through in the general election. Now, what no one saw coming was a clean sweep of everything. So I think first today, let's talk about what the fallout is potentially how it affects our clients, and then where do we go 
to help make people money from this. And, and first of all, at the 30,000 feet view, people in what I would call mainstream media have to be scrambling because most millennials, which is now the biggest generation, those are your up and coming uh, people you want to market to. I've got two sitting in the room with me. I'm old granddad. They only watch they only watch television, quote unquote, to watch Chad sports. And maybe you get a little bit of news, right, JJ? Mm -hmm. They're shaking their heads. So if the news you get is totally incorrect, why would you watch when you can watch Frank Underwood on House of Cards uh, or, you know, binge Game of Thrones? Why would you watch the news? And if you're not watching, why would advertisers pay to watch it? And if they have no advertisers, they can make no profits. They're in big trouble as a business entity. So that And Jim Grant touched on that yesterday morning on CNBC at Central Time around 6.30 to 7, that very, very point, because I think he saw some of this coming. So, so what are the outcomes for clients? As you know, uh, here on our portfolios, uh, we have been in a strong dollar trade really since August, and we've been adding and adding and adding to that dollar position in the UUP. That's because of, we thought maybe a Trump win was, po was possible. We've also been adding to our inflationary positions, both silver and gold, and in the uh, Lord Abbott Inflation Adjusted Bond Fund, I think it's L is it L I F F X or something like that. Those would all be things that would benefit from Trump. And then we also have you know, the special report we had come out about um, defense, defense stocks. Uh, I'm pulling up the PPA right now. No info for the PPA. Look at that chart. Uh, you know, we thought defense would do well. They were off the charts today. At one point, Raytheon today was up almost $20 a share. Uh, in the IRG meeting notes, uh, morning notes this morning, John, I think the quote was maybe $100 billion more spent on defense. And all of our pro-defense long call was based on the rest of the world would spend more money because they would be maybe a little bit worried how Trump w w would react. So those appear to be the, the bets we have made going in. The winners of the clean sweep obviously are health care. So what we're seeing is depending on what how regula regulated your business is, is um, you definitely are winning. Within the healthcare sector, what's the uh, Vanguard healthcare index we use, Chad? Is it V something H? VCH? Yeah, VCH. Uh, the, uh, let's see, VHC. Yeah, VH, well, no, that's different. But basically, you look at AbbVie, the big horse in the uh, for moderate dividend growth, you know, it's had a big move today. Um, Gilead, which is in a couple of our portfolios. So biotechs had a huge run. Pharma, insurance companies finally uh, had a uh, millstone lifted off their back. And the losers here, John, appear to be uh, facilities, specifically hospital stocks, like Tenant, HCA, et cetera. So, so healthcare is winner number one. Uh, winner number two is our business, uh, Ameriprise Stock, thank you. Closed, it looks like at the high of the day. Punched out at a, up 11.27 a share uh, is where we went out. Bank stocks, Wells Fargo's up 245. Met and Prudential up 5 to 7% each. Uh, energy patch is going to be a little bit different game. Uh, fossil fuels, you know, your coal stocks that we follow all did very, very well. Um, you know, this is up 16% today on Alliance. Um, Tesla was down. So energy, natural gas, we had been loading up on natural gas. Um, and probably it's up, but it's not up tremendously. Uh, gas transportation giant, ETE, that was up 17% today. I would take that. So I'd say healthcare, X hospitals, financials, and energy, probably three biggest winners. Let's talk losers. In a strong dollar world, your losers are going to start with the emerging markets. And uh, 
if you can remember, John, remember the old cartoons of Speedy Gonzalez, the Reba Reba. <laughs> Overnight, the Mexican peso hit lows it's never even seen before. So, you know, we're talking about going back to dusty saddles from the three amigos, and the peso hit all-time lows, uh, and it was down another 8.5% today. So emerging markets are really, really taking a hit. So emerging market debt will also take a massive hit because most of that's priced in U.S. dollars. So that's the equivalent of Mexico going to bed with a $100,000 mortgage and waking up with a $108,000 mortgage. That's the ultimate Montezuma's revenge, and, and that's something they're not going to like, and probably the Mexican central bank going to have to step in and support that currency. Also, it's not limited to our friends to the south. Canadian dollar uh, bounced out. It will be interesting to see what the uh, IRG guys do with BCE. That's been a juggernaut within the uh, uh, moderate dividend growth portfolio, John. And that's not a good-looking chart, and that has more to do with currency than it does the stock's performance. And then also in that portfolio, you have National Grid in England. That's a similar stock. If you superimpose upon that the UUP, uh, you can see the stark contrast. So that's so. So I would say everybody needs to be knowing and having a discussion with clients of how important U.S. dollar strength is to their portfolio. If anyone on this call felt like they didn't make a lot of money in 2014, mid-year to 2015, it was all because more than likely the dollar moves. Uh, and not so much where you were in your portfolio. So you want to be positioned in things that do well and when the dollar does well. Here I think, John, are a couple of the losers. One, if you look at you know, our levered bond funds, BBM was down almost 2%. MBB was down about 2.8. Um, you know, what we see is that uh, rates overnight, the 10-year went from 171 um, when the futures were down 850 to I think we came out today at 193, 194. So interest rates have kind of gone up on their own, which is that's amazing what's supposed to happen. Um, so I think bonds are going to take it on the chin for a while. Our, uh, our big REIT, the Blackstone product, is down about you know, 20 cents. You know, you know, it's not bad. And, and higher rates, we'll take that. So the losers look to be with higher rates utilities, John. Um, and then very quietly, let's look at U.S. multinational consumer staples companies. So if you look at who has really won through globalization, Coca-Cola, Kimberly Clark, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, and Clorox. John, there's only so many ways you can market bleach, and there's only so much you can charge for bleach. But if you can sell the same bleach to 1.2 billion Chinamen and a billion Indians, you've really increased your market and your money. So if those emerging markets struggle and we have a strong dollar, I think the real hardcore consumer staple stocks here might be in for a little bit of trouble. So I would say that is kind of the back of the napkin winners and losers. Um, I think probably other potential winners in a big way could be infrastructure plays. Uh, if Trump delivers on what he says he's going to do, uh, I, I think that's you know uh, a big potential. What's funny today is, is, John, we don't have many electric cars here in Owensboro, but there's a couple people that drive Teslas, and, and when somebody in Owensboro pulls up in a Tesla, it's probably like the first guy that had a Model T that pulled up and <laughs> You know, right. the old Bonanza Ranch uh, with Little Joe and Big, you know, uh, Cartwright. Uh, there's two in town. Those are down. But I can, I can tell you what we have in Owensboro, like we have air in the sky. Massive pickup trucks with Cummins diesel engines. Uh, you know, everybody that pulls a lawnmower thinks they need to have about a 500 horsepower Super duty diesel to do it. New high today. So, so we are scouring on our end uh, infrastructure plays with that in mind. The other winner 
and the IRG guys did a very nice job of pointing this out, it's more than likely we're going to get a tax cut. And when you cut taxes for the rich, uh, they typically don't buy peanut butter and more Kleenexes. They want to go out and maybe treat themselves to a nice bottle of uh, Cristal or uh, Jacqueline would like a Birkin bag. Uh, you know, maybe Chad here get him a pair of nice uh, Ferragamo loafers. So luxury brands will be another place that we think could benefit if the tax cuts go through. Temporary losers, and this is where I'll kind of stop for a little bit today, was in the tech sector. And uh, the thought was from IRG that they'd be worried about exports, you know, maybe Apple selling phones to China, et cetera. Uh, look at Amazon, John. Amazon down at one point today, um, another $11, $26 at the lows. Um, I really don't think Trump winning is going to stop me sitting on my couch ordering uh, my men's hair products and grooming products from Amazon like I do, uh, or ordering an uh, Echo for the kids for Christmas. So I think this could be potentially an opportunity um, in the tech space. Also, our friends at BCA have really kind of pounded the table to beware of the talk of the trade war. And I think we've heard that, John, quite a bit, you know, uh, with China. You know, we are basically the Chinese largest trading partner. Um, when the West Coast longshoremen went on strike about a year or two years ago, and all those container ships just piled up uh, in a queue off Long Beach, uh, Oakland, uh, Portland, and Seattle, the Chinese economy literally almost exploded. So they have to have us more than we have to have them. I think if we want our TVs and iPhones made cheaper, they don't have to be made in the old Canton province of Guangzhou. We can have them made in Ho Chi Minh City or Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, or they could be made over in Tel City, Indiana. Uh, so the economists say do not fret about a trade war that people would be cutting off their nose to spite their face to get into a trade war with us. Uh, I do think, though, Today's action provides a glimpse on what they want to see out of Trump. Is one, I think they're going to want to start seeing who's going to be on his team, John. And then as long as he can maintain the cool and even temperament uh, and kind of rule with a uh, little bit of humility, uh, I think we have a chance to probably see some, some pretty good things happen. And I think in a backward way, what this country needed more than anything was wage inflation. And Trump's stance on immigration, although some people might not like it, will provide that uh, and provide it in a market-driven way as opposed to a minimum wage government-mandated way. And think of it this way. Anecdotally, if you look at job postings, let's say in Phoenix, Las Vegas, Southern California, as Trump gained momentum and he got the nomination, what, he, what economists could see was those postings were taking longer to fill, John, and we're requiring more money to be paid for those jobs because a lot of those entry-level workers, those entry-level jobs were undocumented. When those workers took themselves out of the system because they were scared of being caught, wages rose. So entry-level workers save, I mean, sorry, spend pretty much all that they make. They don't save. Spending at that level of the economy is wonderful. Uh, it's a lot of what we would call staple spending, bread and butter spending, and that is inflationary in a pretty good way for wage growth. So I think in a roundabout way, a lot of the people that really, you know, going back to take my argument full circle, where Sanders is up here and Trump's here, I think a lot of Sanders people will see that wage growth there and wanting through mandatory minimum wages, but it'll be market forces driving those. So I think that's probably something that's going to be 180 days in the offing. It won't happen overnight after he takes over, but I would not be surprised that we start seeing more inflationary data as we get through into mid-year 2017. Uh, so I know that's a mouthful that we've kind of started with here and a lot of information, but basically that's kind of the anecdotes that I share with clients. Um, I think, you know, of course I've got clients from both sides of the aisle that is ultra-conservative and conservative. Uh, just kidding. 
But I, I've got them from all over the political spectrum, and I think they can all identify with that. There's a tremendous amount of fear for people that were not Trump supporters. Um, I think Clinton's uh, conciliatory tone today was very well done. Uh, you know, she's a professional politician. It was exactly what needed to be said. And I think if Trump can kind of continue that that tone, I think things will really kind of get off to the right foot. And he'll meet with the president, I guess, later this week and assume that goes well. I think what we could have here is a little bit of a relief rally, John. Um, and then the next thing on the calendar will be the Fed meeting. Um, but I think I've covered pretty much everything. I don't, has anybody kind of typed in or chimed in with any questions? No, no questions yet. Uh, for the group here, go ahead and post there at the bottom right on chat. Uh, if it's not visible, just click on the little, uh, the little triangle by chat. Go ahead and post them in there. Just, uh, just speak up. Let us know what uh, thoughts, questions you have for Drew, and we'll, uh, we'll pass as long as we go. You know, I can't help but think, you know, Jay-Z did a lot of promotion for Hillary is, is what uh, some of the protégés that didn't make it to the East Coast, West Coast rap war would be thinking now. Uh, that all these people that were kind of outlaws 20 years ago are now part of the establishment, John. It's, it's, it's very ironic. But uh, we'll see what happens as, as things kind of take off. Um, I will say uh, the job that they do on the uh, IRG morning research notes are absolutely is awesome. So so everybody on the call, take advantage of that, read that. They provide us lots of actionable ideas and great information that client approved to share with clients. Great great insight. It really is some great stuff that we get which is uh which is good. Well this is an excellent um kind of extended update here uh which is really good. Um, let, let's transition uh, um, a little bit into um, just any, I, I, I guess, I guess year-end plays we may be able to look at. You know, we'll have another um, webinar here at the end of the year that's more for 2017 looking ahead. But Drew, is there anything you're looking out between now and the end of the year? You know, outside of having a little rally here, is there any uh, uh, special moves you'll make or any special talking points with clients you'll have? Yeah, well, and I would say for our advisors we're coaching um, on this call, look at high yield, guys. I mean, if you've had a rally, I know it's come back down to earth. This is the index. I don't know what you all use. Um, I would come out. You know, we, uh, we talked about that on our last call, John, when we did the live remote from our uh, FBI. Thing. <laughs> uh, right, from Chicago. Thing. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't come out of high yield, I, I would do so. The, the spreads aren't there. Uh, that's going to be an area that, that's probably going to be uh, hit pretty hard. I would definitely do that. Take your time. Whoever does your trading in your practice, go through your non-qualified accounts. You can sort by tax lot, right, Chad? Mm -hmm. You know, see what who's had big gains, and if there's any way you can go through and offset those. That is a fantastic financial planning deliverable. We had a top client in this week. We actually had three in one day. That's what we did is just kind of go through the work that Chad had done with where the gains were, uh, what losses we could take to offset those, and how much in income taxes that would save them. Another piece of information, uh, especially if you've ever had – I think this is fantastic. We just kind of happened upon this, John, but it makes people happy, is uh, – how many clients ever come in and say, what do I do with all my files? Or they ACATed, you know, pretty large sums to Ameriprise, and they have their former uh, former uh, advisors, comp firms, and a bunch. If you have a really supersized scanner, offer to scan all those in, keep them in a file electronically, and then shred those for clients. That's been a pretty popular idea that we've had. So uh, that's worked well. That's been very well received by clients. But kind of going into year-end wrap-up, um, I, I probably, if you haven't vacated um, high yield, I would seriously look at doing that. If you've been really exposed to the emerging markets, let's pull that index up. Um, you know, I'd go ahead and take profits from that as well because those are going to be under pressure. Um, so, you know, those are the areas that we've looked at to basically kind of take profit 
uh, and head in towards the end of the year. Uh, I think it would not be crazy to believe that Trump is probably going to be a little bit more, especially initially, domestic only stocks might do a little bit better than multinationals. But there again, that goes back to that U.S. dollar trade, which is the UUP that we use. Um, and that, that's had a pretty good bounce here um, in, the last, in the last few days. So for, from a year-end trading standpoint, that's you know, what we've used, and, and that, those conversations have resonated pretty well with, with our clients. So you, you hit on a uh, um, a nice one there of looking for um, uh, the, the tax gains and losses for clients. So um, you know a, a great year in tax idea. So Drew, Drew, what do you look for when, when you, you look at uh, gains and losses? What are you looking for for people? And then and then after that, what do you uh, what do you say to the client? Well, one. Um, you're looking to try to offset any gains you've taken with losses. Um, and we go through, you know, obviously if it's a discretionary account, we'll do it. If not, we'll, you know, we'll call it the permission. But we look for what hasn't worked. Also, um, you know, is there anything we can use as a substitute so in case that stock were to go up, the, the client really isn't out of it totally. So, you know, if you've had a tech stock, that really, you know, say Amazon or somebody that really went up, you know, we can say, look, we'll, we'll sell the individual stock, you know, or has something at a loss, then we'll buy VGT, which is the index, uh, to have in case, you know, it's not a perfect uh, trade, but we feel like, you know, the client's not totally out of the market either in that circumstance, and they can want to take advantage of it. Uh, before we sell anything, though, too, we check to see if it's close to being ex-dividend. You know, we don't want them to miss a dividend if, if we can't help it. So, so we look to see, one, you know, what can we replace the sale with so they're really not out of the market in case that's everybody's fear. Will I sell and then the thing turned around? And then, two, don't sell right before a dividend so, you know, you're able to kind of keep the client in as much cash flow as possible. So those are kind of two of the tips that we work with there. Um, always know, and this is the year-end tax seminar, you know, get those loss carry forwards. That, if you have the loss carry forwards off their taxes, that's a financial planning deliverable in and of itself every year, and you'll know just how far out you can go with gains and not have to be worried about losses. So, so probably... Out of the tax return, I would almost venture to say that the loss carry forward page, that would be on my podium finishers of most valuable information to have. Mm -hmm. um, I think, too, as people are close to retirement age, around 65, get the Medicare income numbers because you also don't want to blow somebody up into a higher Medicare bracket where they have to pay more in premiums because I think that's coming for everybody, and most clients do realize that. Uh, so you want to be mindful around 170,000 for married filing jointly, 85 grand for single filers. That's where the needle starts moving up. If you do not have a laminated sheet with the Medicare premiums on it, either a you're working in Silicon Valley and all your clients are 40 year old millionaires, um, or you're not doing your job. So, so uh, you know, Rusty, that's, that's a big part of what we do now, John, is looking at where people line up at the end of the year with regards to Medicare. That's a modified adjusted gross income number uh, that the Medicare uses to determine those premiums. And I think most clients are going to realize those, those premiums are probably going to go up because the system's going broke. So that is a very, very important number like the capital loss carry forward to know when it comes to your client situation. On the low end of the situation, what we look at too is look how much of the Social Security is going to be taxable. Uh, if you've got some sweet, you know, little old ladies or little old men that are single now, they're widowed, you know, if there's a way you can keep most of their Social Security from being taxed, that is a home run for them. And, you know, utilize as much of the tax code as you can. I don't know whether or not the zero 
tax on uh, dividends and capital gains in the 15% bracket is going to last through any type of Trump changes. But that is low-hanging fruit, financial planning advice 101, to help people keep more of what they make and really lower the impact of their taxes. From a financial delivery standpoint, our most popular thing, John, has been like a grid that we outline where the money comes from and do tax projections. And, um, you know, what, what's amazing is if you show people the tax impact of them spending more, most of the time they will find ways to not spend that money, which helps them in the long run. It, it, you know, it, it, it really does. Uh, so, you know, those are, those are things that, that we do. And, uh, you know, most people are very kind of, you know, I, I guess you could say they just, I don't want to say stubborn, but they just are very traditional when it comes to their income taxes. And, and, you know, if you can find a way to do things a little bit differently, once they see that work, when they actually get their return done, they're very, very, very satisfied clients. So, so, you know, that in a big way is a way to kind of help them keep more of what they make. So, Drew, tell us about um, the, the deliverable. Um, I, I think you're right on that. That is an absolute grand slam of looking at how much um, taxes you could save somebody making it an annual deliverable. So what, what, uh, how are you making this, um, this letter, giving it to compliance, uploading it? What's, what's, what's that deliverable look like? That's a big question a lot of advisors always have that they want to spice up and create something new that they can show the compliance person or the client. So what, what exactly does that look like? Well, it's very uh, – we start off with something very, very simple. I think less is more uh, unless you're dealing with a, you know, CPA. Even then we do the less is more um, where basically it is literally a grid where we start off with different years. So uh, if you and Kathleen wanted to retire, let's say both of you are 57 and you want to – or let's say you both want to retire at 57, our grid would start off with a – with, with a column that would be, you know, age 57 to age 59 and a half. Uh, the very leftmost column will be sources of income. John, it's your 401k. Kathleen, it's your pension. Your Social Security, her Social Security. Your after-tax accounts. Um, any IRAs, whether or not it's Roths. And those rows carry across. And so, you know, for example, under 59 and a half, we say, this is going to come out of your IRA and your after-tax money because there's no penalty on your IRA. Your IRA is going to overwithhold the 20%. So here's how much other money we can move out. Then let's say from 59 and a half until whatever age your financial plan, which is a supporting document, it's an AVA plan, says you're going to start drawing Social Security. Then we'll say whatever age your Social Security starts is another column until you're 70 and a half. And then we do 70 and a half on. And then we can kind of literally just move those numbers around and show them the tax impact on taking more money out and from which column it's taken out. Also, what this can really do, John, is show them for your wealthier clients the real value of deferring their Social Security. Uh, we had a couple in this week, and by deferring, you know, they're going to, you know, they've got lots of money. But at age 70, it was worth it to them to have $78,000 a year coming in on Social Security income. Um, we have another couple that's going to defer, and it's going to be literally, you know, the projection is when they're in their 70s, about 84000 a year to 90000 a year in Social Security. So, so you can kind of show them the value. Because the other thing is, what I say is, you know, once you kind of get them past the, well, what if I drop dead in my sleep, uh, you have to always remember – you're talking about two lives and the longest life expectancy in the equation. But then when you're drawing your Social Security, that money eats up more tax room that can be used for more flexibility. So we're able to show them that. You know, an example I'll say is, look, I would rather maybe burn through all the IRA money early, uh, you know, withhold taxes, move it to non-qualified, because then we know at age 70 – Here's what your Social Security is going to be. 
your mandatory IRA distribution is going to be much lower, and the rest of it we will you you will live on what's in your after tax account, and perhaps if the tax laws stay as they are, your dividends and capital gains will be zero. So so we're able to show them that in a grid format, and it helps them with their decision making, and it really starts to click why they want to take money out of certain accounts and, and when to start drawing Social Security, et cetera. This is, this is really big. I think this is, um, you know, th this is the kind of stuff that that I think advisors really need to uh, mix up when it comes to deliverables with clients. You know, the the traditional like, uh, you know, your Nava plan or your your tool. It's the same year after year after year. This is a great way to mix up what clients get and also to to suffice and pacify uh, compliance. You know, th this really hits home to what what clients need, and uh, I think. Uh, to help people interpret the value, really helping them see and point out tax savings. I mean, this, this is a, a tremendous way to uh, uh, to bring new, different value, keep it fresh, and help them quantify the value I as well. So, um, so Drew, what other uh, year-end tax savings? What other things are out there that advisors could be on the hunt for with their clients? You know, it, it's it's a Obvious time if they have outside assets for you to get them to bring that in or to consolidate that. This is the perfect time if someone has left money in their 401k plan and not rolled it over to you. This is the perfect time of year to have that meeting because you know what's going through their mind is what? Well, why should I roll this over to you? So you know, Jack and I went through this. You know, we kind of role played it uh, where the question will be. Well, Mr. Advisor Drew, I've got a quarter of a million dollars still in my 401k. Why would I want to roll it over? Well, if you want to take some money out to go deer hunting, let's say, that happens around here, get a new deer stand, rifle. If we take it out of that plan where you work, they're going to mandatorily withhold this percentage taxes, which will be grossly too high. Whereas if you roll it here, if you only need to have 8% withheld or 11, we can put it right on the button and withhold only that amount. And so, the, you know, that conversation doesn't resonate as well in July or June, but when you get down to the end of the year and everybody's thinking about taxes, that's definitely a pretty big weight that goes in the scale of, yeah, you know what, I'm going to roll that out. Um, so that, you know, so this time of year is really a perfect time to revisit those outside assets and to see how flexible they are. The other thing I would really talk about is non-qualified annuities. You know, heaven forbid if they've got one that's only made about 1% or 2% a year, like some of the ones maybe people on this call have, but if they have a loss, that loss is an ordinary income item, John. And so it's a great idea maybe to get out of a really super high fee contract, take a loss that can offset their, their ordinary income potentially, and move those assets. Conversely, if they've been if they have a big gain in an ordinary annuity, a non non qualified annuity, in retirement, a lot of times we'll defer Social Security and just bleed that gain out before Social Security because it's fully taxable. Because essentially, if your clients have done well, they want to leave their kids in a pretty good position. And if they can live off the money at a very, say, 11% tax rate as opposed to, you know, 35, uh, that's a great time to start taking that money out. We, I, I chuckle. We've got a couple clients. We've been doing that now for six years, and things just keeps making money. Uh, of course, those are Hartford annuities. Uh, but, you know, those are the things for outside assets that we look at that uh, I think would be advantageous on bringing – dollars over. Here's another potential, I think, something we're going to go real deep with in 2017, but I see other top advisors do it, is the old, what I call integrated service model. That means, you know, John and Kathleen, you're one of my best clients. Obviously, I want to work with you not only your entire life, but, but you know, we have a team here. I want my team to work with your kids. Um, you know, we're willing to look at their situation pro bono until they can kind of get on their feet. If you want them to bring their financial information by, uh, 
we'll take a look at that for them. Uh, you know, you accomplish a lot of the things there. You build the moat around the relationship. You basically almost ensure, as long as the relationship goes well, that those assets are going to stay with you after the client passes away, and you create, over time, another really good client uh, that will eventually be paying you full fees. But, but I see top advisors that really that do well in the multi-generational world, that's how, that's how their approach is, is let me do this as a favor to you. Now, I took it one step further and say that goes both ways on the uh, family uh, hierarchy. You know, do you have an elderly parent? Not only about your kids. So, so there's a lot of people that have elderly parents, maybe widowed. They end up kind of taking care of mom. Mom may have assisted living center, but son always makes sure the taxes are paid, et cetera. So, so that letter is all about family. It's not just about kids. It's about family and having them work in an integrated fashion. So in our menu of services, that's our, our highest level of work is integrated. So it's not only integrated with your other professionals, John, uh, like CPAs and attorneys, but we're integrated within your family, both, you know, up a generation and down a generation. I love it. Great, great insights here. So, uh, you know, I, I, I smell some uh, referable moments in all of this. You know, there's definitely some uh, uh, there's definitely some p components here that could be um, you know an easy topic for clients to refer. But I think one of the biggest opportunities leading up into tax time is is how to enhance or forge a relationship with the with the CPA. So, Drew, at this point of the year. Are you doing any coordination with CPAs to work together to build some tax savings for clients? Yes. So especially for your top clients, the ones that know, will know, and I bring it up in the deliverable meeting, you know, let me follow up with your CPA. I've got one to do this week. They sold a, a rental house. So absolutely. Now, I'll tell you what I find, and this is also be, put your business owner camp on. A lot of these CPAs, my clients are working with, they ain't getting any younger. So, you know, what, what I feel like, too, is, you know, if the CPAs haven't taken on themselves to get a uh, succession plan for their practice, John, we make notes of who might need to be getting a succession plan. Because, you know, we've got a couple, you're playing phone tag with them night and day, uh, and they're out with different type of ailments. Uh, it's also another discussion point for your client. Your clients appreciate it. You know, there's a way to bring that up as professionals say, look, I don't want to get into your business. But, you know, one of the things we've, I've noticed is, you know, how old is, is, is Lewis? Well, you know, Lewis is 77. Okay. Um, you know, I hate it that he's had this double hernia operation and uh, kidney problems uh, in November. Man, what would we do if this happened in March? Drew, I've never thought about that. It's a good idea. Do you care if we get somebody on deck to be able to take care of this for you uh, if something happens to your guy? N have never had any pushback on that at all. And so clients think that they can tell you're looking out for them, and then um, it, it's a huge potential just to kind of help forge and fortify that relationship. How about um – what, what, what are you finding um, this year with clients? Are you seeing people have more returns? Do they have some cost, uh, cost carry, uh, lost carry forwards from the past? Uh, what, what's, what's been the main uh, thing that you've seen with your clients, and what have you seen with prospects? Well, you know, what I see is sometimes prospects are unaware uh, of kind of that whole concept because who they were working with before, they never discussed it. Most of them have the lost carry forwards on their taxes, didn't even know it. So that's one. Uh, for our people, we took tons of profit over the Brexit in our discretionary trading. So what we're really now is looking for losses. And, you know, kind of where Jacqueline's sitting, I've got a whole stack of papers there that look like half the Pine Purse National Forest that I got to go through to find losses for those non qualified accounts. So, so, so most of our clients now are in a net gain position, and we're going to spend the next month 
just uh, chopping down trees to get them as much losses as possible. Um, and typically that's how we, and I, and I let clients know what our philosophy is too. You know, if you're close to a long-term position, we'll wait. But if we've caught lightning in a bottle, let, are you okay taking profits in the short term? Yes, they are. And then, and then we'll see what we can do to generate a loss later in the year if possible. So, so that's what we're seeing. So for prospects, most of them are unaware of the uh, capital loss carry forwards. It hasn't been discussed with their other advisors. Uh, a lot of them think, well, they're stuck with it. They can only use 3000 a year. Uh, with the volatility that broke out uh, a week ago, we went back to the covered calls, got some pretty good premiums. So that offsets any kind of long-term losses or, or carry forwards they had. So, I mean, that's kind of the what we're seeing uh, across the board. Yeah, I think that, that's a big one with the uh, the any lost carry forward. So, with, with your covered calls, we, we got some advisors um, asking about that. They're finding those opportunities with existing clients, uh, uh, new prospects. Um, how far out of a call are, are you doing? Are you trying to get maximum income for the person offset? You just getting a little bit. I mean, what what, what situations have you seen? Well, I try to go just a one strike out of the uh, one strike price out of the money. Uh, and then get as much premium as we could. That was through October because I felt like we would we had such a run through August. I really did a lot of at the money calls for November expiration. To be honest with you, so we've got those rolling off. Um, hang on, I'll tell you what I've got. Let me look at my accounts, John. Hang on. Um, I know we did the uh, Nasdaq QQQ. Um, I know we did silver, um, which was SLV. I'll tell you what we got open. We've got Celgene Silver Constellation Brands, which got hammered today uh, because of Mexican beer. I don't know which ones there's. Chad, what do they sell? Uh, yeah, that was a 161, and stock went out today. Yeah, so I, I was way out of the money on that. To be honest, and then we had uh, QQQ. So those are the four things we we're writing cover calls on. Very nice. That's some, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's some nice ones to uh, take in some income. So, um, I think uh, I think he said it best that we're, we're coming up on the time that that people are thinking about taxes. The end of the year. Early in the year, people are thinking about it. I think you're right that uh, um, mid-year, you know, uh, June, July, people just aren't thinking about it. So this is this, this is a great topic to mix up the value. Even if you just start with your top five or top ten clients, start working on this stuff. Um, you, I mean, you, you really see the level that Drew goes to, and this is why Drew is able to accumulate high net worth clients. This is the kind of help uh, they're looking for. And, and, you know, Drew, I, I find that, um, you know, CPAs really aren't this – they aren't proactive. They aren't looking for opportunities for clients. They're really just crunching numbers on a return. So, I, I mean, are you finding that with, with CPAs you work with? Are you the one bringing the opportunities to the table for clients and they crunch the numbers? Absolutely. And, and, and you know, you're going to make more money if you make the CPA out to be the hero. Yeah. Uh, you know that, that that's without that's without a doubt, but but yeah, we're the one, uh, you know, to make the make you know bring up the opportunity, and then let them be the hero and kind of figure out the uh, way to do it. Yeah, the uh, uh, I, I I think sometimes advisors are uh, are are scared of CPAs. They say uh, you know CPA calls the shots. I meet and talk with a client four or six times a year. Uh, they're C they meet with their CPA once, and they do whatever they say, which is the opposite of what the advisor says. But um, uh, you, the, the power is in taxes. People do not want to pay taxes. And uh, uh, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll change their tune very quickly if it changes their tax impact this year. So uh, I, I think really you taking the lead – on the tax situation is so important because I I see time and time they're really just uh, they're just number crunchers they're not really finding uh, opportunities and giving advice it's just well this happened last year so I entered it in my computer program and here's your tax return 
So uh, taking the lead on that is huge. But, but, but Drew said something very, very important. In that process, if you can make the CPA look good, you will win all day long. Getting into a, uh, um, you know, put the gloves on, go to the mat battle with the CPA is never a good idea. Make them look good. And anytime you make a CPA look good, they're much more likely to refer you. So uh, I, I think it, now in the, what, about seven months or seven weeks we got left in the year here, think about what tax ideas you can be bringing to your clients. Reach out to their CPA, run it by them, help make them look good. Ask, is there any other people, is there two or three people with this situation we could be helping out? Because uh, you know what? Advisors aren't looking for opportunities either. So um, this can really differentiate you from a, a marketing standpoint and set you apart from the crowd of uh, 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 mediocre uh, financial advisors and mediocre CPAs that are out there. So uh, really, really good ones, great insights. And, uh, yeah, Superman Drew here with, uh, with absolutely a great way to create value and, uh, and help people out from a tax perspective. So, uh, so Drew, before we close it down here, any, any uh, final thoughts uh, before we get to uh, High Point, North Carolina, and D2 Live next week? Uh, you know, I will say this. I'm a history buff. John, you know me. Everybody here on the call witnessed history last night. Uh, the United States electorate has said they want to try something different, and I think they've sent a message uh, to Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm reminded of the, the original Star Wars movie when Obi-Wan Kenobi and has a young Luke Skywalker overlooking Mos Eisley spaceport, and he says, you'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy in the universe. That's what a lot <laughs> of people think of Washington, D.C., so we have a chance to see what happens here. I'm sure we'll have increased volatility. I'm sure we'll have clients who have concerns, uh, no matter what their political stripes are. And I think it's an opportunity to be out in front of them, uh, to be a leader for them, and to be uh, mindful that you know some of this is just kind of off the script, uh, but we're going to go with it as best that we can. And America is the greatest country on earth for a reason that we get things done. And now it is time in our history to kind of get things done again. I think the tone from both sides today has been set very well. And I think when clients are worried, we just need to let them know that there's opportunity there. Uh, this is the land of milk and honey, as the Old Testament would say. And, uh, we're blessed to be here, and let's just uh, let's make it up and make it happen, and uh, we'll see everybody in High Point. That's right. Next week, uh, D2 Live, we'll see everyone, uh, most of you on Wednesday, uh, some of you on Tuesday. But um, uh, if you can't be there, we will miss you. Uh, we will be back with our uh, kind of 2017 outlook and, uh, and strategies webinar here just in a few weeks. But uh, everyone stay bullish. Drew's right. Remember, America is the greatest country on earth, and we'll see all of you in High Point next week. Take care.